Okay, thank you so much again for joining us for the next part of our talk. Um, I really appreciate being here and being invited to be here to share the words of Torah together. I believe it's really, really important for women when they keep mitzvot to know the source and where it comes from. Because a lot of times women keep what they keep, but nobody like really goes to tell you where is the source? Where is it coming from? Why are you keeping it? And um, with like some even more like Orthodox community, it's not like the typical way. Like, you know, you just follow and you keep and you do it with a full heart. But I believe Google shouldn't be the answer to things. We need to like teach and show our children where is the true definition and the information coming from? So I'm going to share some things. You guys could go do your own research because I, I, I'm when I keep something, I get very hyper focused on it, and I want to know the ins and outs. Like I, I cannot just take the answer. I get very stubborn and obsessed. Like I want to know where it's coming from. So I do a lot of research. So whatever I'm sharing with you guys, it's like a research I did for you, like years that I compiled this information that I am giving over to you. So. Um, one of years ago, one time when we were doing the half Russia class, as I was sitting there and telling this woman to say the bracha, she got up and she said the bracha. And then she said, blessed are you God that gives us the mitzvah of separating from the rest of the dough. And then she picked it up. She raised that and she said, and you know how in the movies you see everything freezes. And then I'm like, wait a minute. That doesn't make any sense. How could that be called khala and that be called khala? If we just said hare zo khala, so if that's khala and that's the Isa, they cannot both be khala, right? It's either day or night. It's either Shabbat or weekday. It's either meat or dairy. Like it cannot be both. So I was like, this is so weird. Like, I wonder where that came from. And it just like started my like curiosity. Then I started thinking to myself, we never even had this bread in Iran. Like, <laughs> why is there so much focus? Because my classes are very like into the tachlis of this. And then that also started making me wonder, like, where did this come from? Like, I saw I mean, it didn't have an oven for her bread to look so fluffy and voluptuous and like, and like the bread back in the day, the bread of Israel, like you go to Israel on a birthright trip, you sit on a camel, they take you to this tent, they give you this bread, it tastes nothing like this. Like, I'm like, this is not making sense to me. Like there's something about this that's not. So then I started my research and investigation of what in the world, like, where did this all come from? So fact number one, challah is not a Jewish bread. Challah originated the style of the bread that we see now started when the Jews after the destruction of the second Beit HaMikdash migrated besides all the Sephardi countries they also went into the European countries so 900 years ago when the Jews went into Europe one of the styles of bread that they had it's called Hafezopif it's called Haf H A Haf A F E Zopif Hafezopif it was a luxury bread that they would have. And that bread in it also had milk. And when the Jews migrated from um, Israel to there, and they didn't have uh, access to flour all the time, so they would only make this bread and the separation for Shabbat. So the reason, then they started to call their bread uh, challah to remember to do the mitzvah of challah. So they dropped the milk, but they kept the egg and sugar. Before 900 years ago, we never had anything such as a sweet bread. That was never part of our minhag. Our minhag was a very Sephardi tasting bread. And um, becher, becher in German, or they would call it becher. So this, this bread has a historical history in Germany. So I did some research about it that why did they call, like if, if Germans have this, why would it be called challah? Why would it, oh, and then also um, they have a custom that on Easter, it's called the Easter bread, that pagans also have a ritual. There was a lot of pagans in Germany and bread and bread making and the style of bread making had a lot of significance for them. So if any of you have ever had pagan friends or pagan neighbors, on um, uh, during Easter, during their Easter Sunday, this is the bread they eat, and they put a baby doll inside of it. You know the whole thing of that they put key in the bread by some 
groups, they put a, they put the, like a baby doll inside of it, and the bread looks just like the braided bread we have. So now, now I was like, what in the world? So then I started doing more um, research about like, so then where did the origin come from? Like, what's the origin? So there is two parts into this bread making. So one of the things we have to understand that bread has a big, big significance to us as Jews. Bread is like bread of life. Bread has like one of the first things God taught Adam HaRishon when he committed the sin was from now on with the sweat of your forehead, you're going to like earn the bread of your hand. So bread is connected to finances and monetary. And Jews, we have a lot of value for bread, not to waste it, not to, you know, so the history of bread is very fascinating. So what people call bread, bread of slavery, which is matzah, really, if you think about it by us, it's a bread of freedom. The Jews come out of Egypt. They're wanting to come out. They don't have time for their bread to rise. So what happens? Their bread turns into matzah, right? So that's the first step. They took the step. So it's like when you go through nisayon and challenges of your life, when you make the best and you walk forward, God does the rest. You know, my grandmother, my mom and sister used to say, as to harakat, as choda, barakat. As to harakat, you make the movement and God will send you the blessing. So what happened? The Jews, imagine, in Mitzrayim, slave for all these years, there are, they go, what did they take with them? What did they take with them? Bread, the only thing they have. What did they do? They moved though, they went. So what happened? After 30 days, what happened? The bread ran out. The bread ran out. Now these Bene Israel had seen the nest, had seen the ten plague, had seen. Did they say, oh, Moshe, we know for sure you're going to rescue us? Did they do that? What did they do? Complain. They complained. They come, we're still going to give credit. What they did, they walked, they moved. So I'm saying it because when we complain and go through any science in life, we should know we're human. As long as we connect it back to God and make that oneness, it's still we're in a good place. So, so they come, they're like, if you wanted us to starve, why did you, you should have just let us die there. Why did you bring us out? Blah, 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 blah. And then Hashem says to them, don't be afraid. The heavenly bread is going to come. So from, from the bread of like, you make the movement through the hardest time, then God will give you the miracles in the ways that's supposed to. And they say the man was so, uh, it had everything in it so that all they had to do was fix it up and eat it, right? So Moshe comes and tells Bene Israel, every day you come, you take one portion per person per that day, right? If you take extra, it's going to go bad, you know, just one portion. Every day, every day, every day. But what happens on Friday in Parashat Beshalach? We're going to be reading this parasha in two weeks from now. It's like three weeks, not this week, two weeks. Parashat Beshalach. What happens? What happens on Friday? What happens with Amon? It doubled. On Friday, this story is like 3,000 years old. Do you understand? Like we are living, like Torah is a living essence. It's not just a historical fact. 3,000 years ago, our ancestors on Friday night got bread double the amount on Friday night. And they come and they tell Moshe, you said every day take one. Why is there two? So Moshe says to them, because tomorrow is Shabbat and tomorrow is a day of rest. Therefore, today, the bread for tomorrow is going to come now. So the reason on Friday night we say hamotzi on two breads, regardless of what it looks like and what, it, uh, what shape it has. And when you Google challah, one, one, one day I will have enough money that my website will come up, the truth about challah, not what you see now. So when you put in the word challah, this is, the German bread is not what you're supposed to see. It's going to be the second part of what I'm going to share with you. So the reason on Friday night we say hamotzi on two bread has to do with the mitzvah of lechem mishne. That's what it was called. In the parasha of Beshalach, Hashem says, laktuhu lechem mishne. You should take for yourself the second bread for tomorrow. So till this day, 3,000 years later, when we say hamotzi on Friday night on two bread, we're saying, dear God, just like you provided for my ancestors what they needed in the desert on during the week for Saturday, I know you're going to, you have already provided for my family what I need on Saturday. 
do you do you hear like the power mm-hmm. in that so when i sit down and my father or my mother or whoever or i pick up the bread and i say hamotzi it's not just all oh, nice to bread i'm saying i am reliving 3000 years of history you guys this is not a joke 3000 is not like one century it's three centuries right right every 100 years it's three centuries ago our ancestors on friday night God double. So our appreciation and gratitude to God is that when today in my home on Friday night, when I say hamotzi on tupita, sangak, barbari, lafa, whatever you want, the braided bread, does it matter? No. As long as it's too complete bread. And Harav Ovadia Yosef holds that even if you roll up your bread, you put it in a pan and they stick together, but your intention was that they're individual breads, you could separate them and say hamotzi on two. And look how much value they had for bread that they would say hamotzi on one and save the other for the next day. And then Arizal, um, he's the Kabbalistic, very Kabbalistic, they do 12 breads. And the 12 bread is to resemble what there was in the Beit HaMikdash, on the Lechem, Lechem Hapa, um, uh, the, the Lechem Hapanim, I think that's what it was, the Lechem Hapanim, the bread table. In the Beit HaMikdash, in the Holy of the Holies, there was three tables. There was the bread table that had 12, ta- 12 sections for the 12 Shabbatim. There was the menorah, and then there was the incense where the smells would come out. So on Friday night, when we're saying Hamotzi and when we make bread with our hand, we are, you could fold it. You are, you are reliving the mitzvah and that re- commemoration of that. So I always tell people, even if you don't get the chance to do the half rasha, even if you do a smaller portion and you do three cups, you tell yourself, Hashem, I'm doing this with the avodah of my hand to do the lechem mishneh, to say hamotzi on it, because everything for God is about relationship. Remember the example I gave you guys about Joanne? God wants us to make relationship with everything we have. When you make your bread with your own hand, pay attention. On Friday night, when the bread gets everywhere, you're very sensitive and you eat it. But if it's the bread from the store, you could care for care less. But when you see it's the bread you made and you put it on the table and the person cuts it and puts it around, you have a feeling because that dough was made in your head. You made that bread. When people make the smallest reaction as they're chewing it, it's like they're eating you. They're, you're like, that, that's the one I made. You know, like, that's my bread. Because God says, this is how I want you to make a connection with me. This is our relationship. Our relationship is like what you guys are doing That You're slowing down your day. You're coming and you're learning to create a relationship, right? Are, are you guys following? Am I saying this fast? So the reason we say hamotzi on the two bread is to commemorate the lechem mishne that the man came double. That is the reason. So then, now I'm having this curiosity of where did challah come from? Like, what is that now? So, and also in Iran, we never had um, the custom of the bread of bread, like I said, but I remember that Mama Nestor, my grandmother used to always, like whatever bread we would bring, it was two of them, whether it was the long sangak or the barbari, she would always like put it on the table. She wouldn't let the kids touch it. She would say, you're not allowed to move, touch it till we say kiddush, and it was kept on top, and we knew it had to be two. But kavo the Shabbat, and we knew it had to say hamotzi on two bread. So now my curiosity is like, what? where did that come from? So now we forward it 40 years later, right? The Jews are in the Midbar for 40 years. They're getting man. The man is coming down. The righteous people, the man is closer. The, the ones that are needed more work, they have to walk more to go get their man. Um, there's, a, there's a saying that the ones that were like, you know, like more kadosh or whatever it was, they would come, they had less work. The other ones, and this is not like a like you know the concept of measurement in Torah is very significant, especially when it comes to flour and bread. We do not do like wasting. You know, there's this whole like carbon uh, footprint. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you guys have heard it. Like they got that from the Torah. I told my husband he needs to become a coach for them. He will succeed. My husband is like so into energy saving and everything. When the, I'm doing this. Um, life coaching when the lady was talking about it i'm like what there's other people like my husband in the world like they sit with you about like you know global warming and all of this it comes from judaism like do, do not wasting 
don't do Baal Tashchit. I'm not an expert in it. My husband is. But like Baal Tashchit is like, so even Kazai, if you take a measure, what's a Kazai? The size of an olive. Like who cares? No, the Torah cares. Everything that comes from the earth, you have value for it. You don't just like, you know, throw it out. So the Jews are in the Midbar for 40 years. The man is coming. Now they're getting close to Canaan, to Eretz Israel, right? What happens? Again, a month. A month goes by, and now what happens? The man, the man stops. There's no more man. There's no more man. So what is one of the first mitzvahs God tells Ben Israel? The first mitzvah in the book of Bamidbar, in the book of Bamidbar, Parashat Shalach, God gives Bnei Israel the mitzvah of Hafrashat Chala. Now imagine 40 years, luxurious life. They're getting my how in the world are you going to expect these people to make dough for you? All, it was like literally on the front of their door. So God says, from now on, you're going to have the mitzvah of Hafrasha. When you come into the land and you take from its wheat and you make yourself dough, the first portion of it, you bring for me as an offering. So in the book of Bamidbar, we learn about the mitzvah of hafrashat chala. And what does God mean when you bring for me? Right? And if everything in the Torah, it's about integration and connectivity. What does God say? God says, the Shevatim, everyone has a role, right? The Kohanim don't get a land because they are going to be serving where? The Beit HaMikdash. So their wives have no flour or wheat that's going to come for them because their husbands are serving in the Beit HaMikdash. So what does God say? The rest of you, that your husbands are going to be on the land and farming and having access to wheat. Now you have an obligation to take your dough to the wife of the Kohanim. And when you read in the Shulchan Aruch what the Chala is, Chala is a dough. This dough cannot be baked. You cannot add anything to it. You cannot shape it. You cannot do anything. All it has to be is a portion of a dough that you go to your neighbor, that's the wife of a Kohen, you knock on the door and you say, I'm bringing you the Chala. So the Chala, the mitzvah of the Hafrashat Chala is supposed to remind us of the mitzvah of giving. It's not about taking. It's not about the Chala on my table. It's not about the deliciousness of my bread, my this, my that. When you hear the word Chala, you have to remember that how all B'nai Israel are interconnected. The holiest of the holies, the highest priest, who do they depend on the bread for his wife and children? On me. And who do I depend on to take the offering to God for me? On the Kohanim. So my husband always tells me after 120 years, I'm sure the mitzvah of challah is going to come in front of God and say she did not stop talking about you. Um, <laughs> because I, I really believe knowing the truth of where things come from. How, what we think of the word challah now, and when Mashiach comes, it's going to be a big problem. Because people are going to be very confused. When they say, give us the challah, people are going to be like, what, this is our Shabbat table we eat? And no, you don't eat challah. You eat the rest of the dough that you're taking home to make bread for. And challah gets done any time of the day. The reason it was associated also to Shabbat nowadays was because the access of not having enough access to flour. So when they had access to make dough and bread for bread for any time, they would do it in the covered of Shabbat. So that was the reason. But like, let's say when my husband was working as a mashkiach at Unique, every few days they had more than five pounds. So then they would do a hafrasha. So they would have to take from it. So, um, and also what was the other? A man can say it too. It's not only for the woman. Men can say it, but it's one of the mitzvot that women do. So if you even make bread on Monday or Tuesday, you still take a portion. So then I also had this question of why five pounds? So my husband said, God has expectation of everyone on their own standard. So someone that the husband is making barely enough, bringing barely enough flour for them to eat, God is not going to obligate them to give the dough. But that other family that her husband brought in more than five pounds, he has more than his family, then he's obligated. However, if the one that doesn't have much would even come and bring like a kazai, like a little olive size, that would also be accepted as a gift. He was not obligated, but it would be accepted. So that was the, the, the whole point of the mitzvah of hafrasha was about thinking about others. 
the mitzvah is to teach us thing. And the word challah in the Torah is referred to as a loaf. You know, chalot, two loaves. It's not necessarily an identified looking bread. It doesn't look a particular way. If you take challah to a Afghan, if you go to a Baghdad, show it to a woman that's living in her tent of, of next to whatever, and you tell her, what is this? She'll be like, I have no idea what this is. But if you show her matzah, she'll say, that's matzah. That's what we eat on Passover. And this is a lesson we need to ingrain in our kid's head. Like for me, it really hurts me. I'm sorry, it really hurts me that this German bread has become such a pro- primary factor on people's Shabbat table. Like on the level of, uh, um, I, my brother-in-law is also like very crazy about this because they obsess over it as if it's on the level of wine and kiddush on a Shabbat table. Give me a break. You know how many times we used to have guests that I had Pita or Fava, they would say, aren't you going to bring the Chala? I'm like, what? And they're like, oh no, you started with Natalie. Do you understand the toxicity of this? Like, do you guys realize the danger of this? Huh? I said it can be a tortilla. It can be a, a tortilla? Uh, yeah, I guess tortilla. But yeah, as long as it's like flour. Yeah. But I think you understand the damage of it. A country that killed 6 million of us, not, it was during our parents' generation. Now their bread has become such a big thing. I'm, I mean, Ashkenazis, mm-hmm. European Jews are very into it. But again, there is no such a thing as a, that German bread being the significant of the Shabbat table. It's on all the bread covering. It's on all about the story of the parashat. Shem. I made my own special bread covering. Maybe this year we should do like an arts and craft and everybody designs their own bread covering with the story of the man coming out double. Like that is the reason why we have that. And it might sound funny to you guys, but it's pretty depressing that when you put the word challah in Google now, I, I used to have a website, but I didn't pay for it and it turned off. But um, <laughs> maybe I should get it up again. I wrote Jewish challah. That was the website, jewishchala.com. And I had all the sources. But it's pretty depressing that when you put the word in challah in Google right now, all you learn is about how to make this German bread, how to do this and how to make it fluffier. And that there's nothing about the mitzvah of challah. And this is not where it's supposed to be. Like assimilation is not about just marrying non-Jews. Assimilation is a little bit of this at a time. So when people go to people's house on Shabbat and they ask that, they embarrass the host. And these breads are very expensive. They're like $5 each. I'm just being like really heart to heart talk. You need to know the facts. You need to know what you're... Wine is mandatory. Two loaves of bread, whatever it looks like, is mandatory. Like these things are... Everything else, you can let it slide. doesn't matter if it's that or not. So... When we do these mitzvot, we need to know it from the inside and also not to waste. What are you doing baking a huge bread if it's only two of you and you're going to waste the rest? What are you doing breaking it as fluffy as can be and then you cut it up and it looks like a wounded bread and nobody's going to touch it the next day? So make small rolls and whatever is extra, use the next day. This is the way of the Jews, the bar mitzvah bread. You have a six feet bread. For what? One day, someone should make a fake version of this like they do for everything else. We should paint it. And every, it's all about the pictures. Everyone else does it, so I need to do it. There is no mitzvah to wasting bread. People do it at their weddings. None of you should do this. I'm telling you, bread is significant for parnasa. Get small breads. Have them say, send, take the lava. Let's make a new movement. No. <laughs> wasting bread is not our way. Our philosophy is you don't waste bread, but we believe there's malachim with it. You watch it. They say the parnasa of the home depends on how you use you what you do with your bread. So, um, sorry, I just get very like thing with this because it's like very uh, it bothers me a lot. So, and then over the years of my investigation, like I found out that with this whole half, my husband said, "Oh, you're having so much fun doing these classes. I just hope you know that whatever dough these people make and what they do with it, you're responsible for it." I'm like, "What?" He's like, "Yeah, when these people come and make the dough and they go home and they don't use it and they throw it out, those angels but that were created by that dough." will be linked back to you. And from my luck, that week when I did a class,